Well, good evening, everybody. It's Wednesday night, and uh, we're here at Arbor Christian Fellowship. And I'm Pastor Danny, as some of you know, and some of you that are viewing for the first time. And on Wednesday night, we have a, a Bible study. We also, we also on Sunday, live stream on Facebook, like that you're watching on our worship service. It's at 1045 Pacific Standard Time, California. And we've had views and people watching from Africa, Australia, up and down California and other parts of the, of the United States. And uh, I want to report to you that our Easter Sunday uh, service uh, had 2000, at least two, 221,000 views. And so even more than that, even, even more than that. Uh, so uh, we just, uh, I'm just amazed. Uh, I'm, I'm just amazed and uh, what God could do. By the way, you know, they try to shut down the churches uh, there. And uh, when that happened, uh, our church started live streaming, and we've reached way, way, way more people. If somebody would have told me a year and a half ago that uh, we're going to be impacting on a Sunday service uh, a quarter of a million people and more, I just would have thought, whoa, what in the world? But that's through the magic of digital life and Facebook. So glad you're glad you're viewing uh, with us. And so I want to I want to do a little uh, message uh, that ties in somewhat with America. But I also wanted to uh, talk about the last days, the the end times, with what's going on today in in America, with the political turmoil we experienced in in November, uncertainty. And uh, the one thing I'm certain of is we're being lied to big time by our politicians and our media. Uh, one of the signs of the last days will be these lies and people believing a deception and, and a, a lie. And uh, I, I'm talking uh, tonight from 2 Timothy chapter 3, a letter that Paul wrote to a young man named Timothy who basically followed in Paul's footsteps. Uh, Paul mentored him. Paul uh, trained him. He wrote him two letters, two personal letters about uh, ministry and, and life and, and things. And uh, this is believed to be Paul's last letter and his valedictory, his goodbye. And uh, in it, uh, he, he talks about some things about the last day. So, the title of my message is Description and Deception of the Last Days because they tie a lot to today. With the COVID virus uh, in the news and the political turmoil and uncertainty about who really is the, the, the president, I think we all knew who really is the real president, but I'm not going to get into that tonight. We see a variety of uncertainty of things. And so what... I realize and, and sense that uh, one of the things about the last days is that there would be some uncertain times, just some real uncertain times. And so I want to begin reading in the book of Second Timothy chapter 3, and uh, I want to really focus in on, on the first verse and then on uh, uh, a couple other verses that follow after, but the this description and deception of the last days. One of the questions that people have asked me, and I was even asked today, uh, but constantly I've been asked, is what's going on with the COVID uh, and uh, some of the turmoil, is this predicted or prophesied in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible? And it does talk about that in the last days there will be plagues and pestilences and just a variety of things, signs in the sky and the sun and moon and a variety of things. And my standard stock answer is that if it's not directly prophesied what's going on right now in the book of Revelation, we are at the very cusp of it, or we are kissing it. I mean, we are right at the very cusp of the biblical end times last days. Technically, the last days is the church age, and uh, we are now in the end of the last days. And the last days here, in context, is talking about right when Christ returns, up to the time and point when Christ returns. 
And by the way, biblically, nothing has to happen for Christ's return in the air and to take his church body home. The dead in Christ will rise out of their tombs and graves. They're, they'll have a new body. It'll be united with the spirit that's up in heaven with the Lord. We never lose our identity after we die and we're in heaven with the Lord. We get a, a new, fresh, eternal, spiritual body. No arthritis, no high blood pressure, no diabetes, no heart condition, but something that is pretty perfect and something that is, is, is well. So Christ can come any moment. Christ can come any minute. People have said, well, they've been saying that we're in the last days for 2,000 years. Well, something happened in 1948 that applies, actually applies to the last days, the last days before Christ comes back, and it's the regathering of Israel. It's the regathering of Israel that happened in 1948. And uh, you have to remember that in 70 AD, Titus and his army from Rome destroyed Jerusalem, burned the temple, burned Jerusalem, and Israel was a people without a nation. And you'd heard the term the wandering Jew, and they were all over the place, there in Europe. What's amazing is when they regathered and became a nation, and by the way, no nation in history has ever had that happen, that they're dislocated from their homeland, and then they come back as a group of people still existing after, you know, 2,000 years, and come back to the very soil and the very land in 1948. So that that puts the days we're in at the last of the last days. And Christ can return any minute. So I want to get into the description and deception of the last days. So in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, Paul writes to Timothy, he says, realize this. And I want to focus on that, on that realize, realize, be aware, know, look around. See what's happening. Be aware that we who are alive today, we are blessed in God's plan and God's will for us to be at this time, at this time in history, at the end of the days, at the, at the last days before Christ returns. Realize this, that in the last days, difficult, difficult times will come. Difficult times will come. Uh, the King James Bible says perilous times by New American Standard, and I, I use the New American Standard for Bible study, though I love personal study and private devotions in the what I call the King Jimmy, the King James Version. 1611, by the way, New American Standard is modern English, and it's American English. I don't talk British English to anybody. And uh, But I speak basic American, perhaps not well, even though English is my third uh, language. Uh, it's not my mother tongue or second tongue. It's my third one, and I learned it. And uh, I don't have an obvious accent, but I run across people that are professional language people or linguists in the university or here and there, and the first thing they ask me is, that English is not your mother tongue, is it? And I go, no, it isn't. How do you know? says, well, I've got the skill in my profession to be able to, to tell. In any language, no matter what it is, the Bible says that before Christ returns, there will be difficult and perilous times. Difficult times are Holman Christian Standard Bible Translation, which is a Southern Baptist Bible uh, written for Southern Baptists and things. Uh, it uses the term difficult. Uh, there will be a, a difficult time. And that word difficult literally means it will be a time, check this out, that people will be weak. Did you hear me? People will be weak. And literally in the Greek, it means a reducing of strength and dangerous times. It will be a furious and fierce time. It, it's that difficult, perilous times, uh, fierceness. Uh, furious times where there's reduction in strength and there's uh, the people will be weak they, they, they will be weak and we seem to be uh, hovering and, and living in that time with, with perilous things 
it's a, a perilous thing to watch the news. It, it, it isn't uplifting. Now, in, in the local news, you know, your 6 o'clock news and then your 11 o'clock news, you've got the local stations, the way they set up the news. And I was involved in journalism there, Christian journalism, and had been involved in news and uh, with uh, uh, KKVV TV there in Las Vegas and had my own show. And when they do the news, they remember there used to be a thing in the news called Happy Talk, Happy Talk uh-huh. News, where at ABC, Channel 7 was one of those that was really big into it. And you had the three or four anchors, and they'd have this banter and chatter in between them, and it was all happy talk and uplifting talk. And uh, you don't see that nowadays in the news. So much of it is pretty, pretty grim and, uh, and, and pretty negative. But I've got, I've got good news. It's from the Word of God. But wouldn't you agree with me that all of a sudden we are living in perilous times? It, it's like something happened in the year 2020 last year. It's like the switch was turned on or somebody pulled a plug or something. And all of a sudden it's a complete different world we live in and, in a way, a complete different America we live in. And I'm not just talking about the COVID-19 and the virus. And uh, by the way, you may shut me off after I say this. You may not agree with me and and things. uh, But I just wonder, I I may be stupid. I I wonder how is it that a virus that has a 99.9% recovery rate, if you're 65 and under, caused such a hubbub and stopped the world and changed everything? I, I don't get it. And if you're 65 and over and have a comorbidity, as they say, high blood pressure, diabetes, a heart condition, it's a 98.1 recovery rate. How is it that, that uh, somebody is feeding us something or conditioning our minds or, or playing with us? Uh, you know, I wonder whether those masks really even work. They're saying that those blue paper masks, uh, I did this today. I took it and I lifted it up towards the sun. That thing was porous. I could see holes all throughout it. Uh, those holes are way bigger than the little virus thing that, that come in and, and, and come out. And I, I don't understand. I don't understand the end of life for so many things. And uh, shut down the churches. Last Easter, Easter of 2020, was the first time in the history of Christianity in the 2,000 years since the first Easter that worldwide churches were were shut down. We were shut down last Easter Sunday, and we Facebooked and live streamed our, our service. And then uh, this past uh, Easter, uh, the doors were open, and uh, people came. And and so uh, we're we're seeing shifts and and changes. We're we're being lied to by our politicians and by our media. I don't trust, I just, my trust level has gone down. Now, maybe I'm a natural cynic, I don't know. I just don't believe a word any politician says, or even the media. They're conditioning us and lying uh, to us. And as I started back in my younger days, when you'd watch the news, you'd have happy talk news, and there was good news and uplifting news, and they'd always have all the news, including all the bad news and fires and accidents and war here, war there, and this. But at the end, they would always have a warm, fuzzy puppy story. You know, a warm and fuzzy story at the end. And uh, concluding with happy talk. And even the news today is, is not happy talk. It, it's, I, I don't know how those liars can actually be happy that are so-called news anchors. Now, not all, you, you know, not, not all, but we are being, you see, that's why the title of this study tonight is called The Description and the Deception of the Last Days. So, Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, okay, I've done my rant, so I'll get into the Word of God now. Okay, I got it off my chest, and I feel better now, all right? Fair <laughs> enough? Fair enough, folks? Okay, but realize this, that in the last days, perilous Difficult times will come. Times that will show people's weakness. Times that will be furious and fierce. A time of reducing strength. Of of reducing people's strength. People will become weak and they will give in. They They will give in. 
they will give in to what Fauci says and give in. Instead of listening to the Word of God, listening to truth, listening to most pastors that preach the truth, listening to our government liars. If I sound severe, I know you're shocked because it's uncharacteristic of me. I'm always talking sweet things and nice things and uplifting things. But listen, every once in a while, a pastor has to have some slapping power. And tonight's the night for a little bit of slapping, okay? <laughs> uh, realize this, in the last days, perilous times shall come. For men and women will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. Boasting, arrogant, reviers, disobedient to parents, uh, the problem between generations, ungrateful, un unholy, un unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossip, without self-control, brutal. Uh, how about haters of good? Haters of good, uh, treacherous, reckless, conceited, and then the kicker, lover of pleasure more than lovers of God. Holding to a form of godliness, though they have denied its power, Paul writes to Timothy, from such turn away, avoid such men as, as these. Now, it's interesting. Here's a list of sins and bad stuff. Another chapter in the Bible, Romans chapter 1, lists a whole litany of bad stuff that is going on in the culture and society going on in the Roman Empire. That, in Romans 1, all the bad stuff, read it tonight after verse 18. It's after verse 18, after Paul's introduction to the, you know, the Christians in Rome. He lists off all this bad stuff that's going on. That was a description of the secular, non-churchy, so to speak, non-religious, if you say so, uh, world. The secular world. 2 Timothy 3, most Bible commentators and scholars that I read and studied to prepare for this say that this not only applies to the secular lost world, the world of government, business, politics, showbiz, entertainment, academia, and everything else, but also to the C-H-U-R-C-H, -H, the church. And I like the letter U in the church because you are the church you are in the in the church so this relates to even the church itself some churches being being deceived by uh this description so the first thing paul says is is realize this he says in verse five they hold a form of godliness although they have denied its power avoid avoid such men as as these Verse 6, now sorry ladies, I'm not picking on you. I'm just saying what the Bible says. And you'll understand why this is presented the way it is in a, in a moment. So stick with me. Verse 6 says, for among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women. Weighed down with sins led on by various impulses. Always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why does Paul... Uh, Paul was not a woman hater, by the way. But why does Paul single out and, and talk about uh, captivate weak women? All right, let me ask you a question. Ellen G. White. Other major cults, big cults, were actually started by deceived and deceptive women. So, ladies, I'm not opposed to ladies. I'm not opposed to women in the church. I'm not opposed to some of them leading. I... It's wonderful to have men and women in God's house. But Paul makes the example here that in that day, and among the various so-called cults, cults that we have today, these pull in and draw in women, and some of them were actually founded by deceived and deceptive, anti-Christic, in some cases I would even say demon-filled women. Now, I don't want to get too spooky you know, I don't want the music from the twilight zone coming in the, in the background here. But this is a reality. This is a reality. And it explains part of what is going on today in America. There is an anti-Christic spirit that starting some way, somehow in 2020 has come out of the closet. It's always been there, but now the difference is that it is in your face. And it is being accepted by politics and the media and and at large 
And I believe there's going to come a day and time that we're going to see persecution among Christians in America. Uh, there's been administrative persecution. Churches were shut down last Easter. It's the first time, as I mentioned earlier, first time in 2,000 years that Easter Sunday, worldwide, globally, churches, uh, or the majority of churches were shut down. Were shut down. And so deceptive times will come. Uh, verse 6, to continue, among them are those who enter in the households, captivate weak women, weighted down by sins and led on by various impulses, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, have you seen from a lot of the cults in these groups, they've got all these knowledges, all these answers, they've got these booklets and pamphlets, the watchtower and this and that, and uh, they're... they're they're, they're, they, they know so much, and they claim they, they know it all, but the scripture says here of these that they do not have the knowledge of truth. They don't have the knowledge of truth. Verse 8, Paul uses an example from Hebrew history. In the wilderness, uh, two people named James and Jambres who opposed Moses, who opposed Moses, did some bogus uh, uh, sayings and tried to draw people away from the teaching and leadership of Moses. And what we see today is the enemy's attempt to draw people away from the truth and those who speak truth to criticize them instead of following God's truth in the scripture. Notice, just as James and Jambres opposed Moses, so these also oppose the truth. Now, there is not having knowledge of the truth and denying the truth, but then opposing truth. We're seeing today, would you not agree with me, in America, slowly, step by step, and now it's out in the open, a movement that opposes God's truth. Opposes God's truth. And a lot of churches have compromised. A lot of churches have, have uh, softened up, uh, you know, and they... They say they don't want to be offensive, and I don't want to be offensive either. I don't look to, I don't look for controversy, and I don't look to offend people by what I say. I believe the Bible truth in and of itself offends, offends the offends those that are living a lie. But notice they oppose the truth. Men of depraved mind reject it in regard to the faith, but they will not make any further progress, for their folly will be obvious to all, just as James and Jambres' folly was also. So, first thing we need to be aware and realize. Now, you hear the term today, being woke. Being woke. I can name names of Christian celebrities and very popular pastors and preachers and things that, uh, you know, I'm not judging, I'm just saying truth, that uh, they claim to be woke. And they're saying we need to support certain communistic movements, and you know what I'm talking about. And it's a it's a it's a shocker to me. Uh, it, it it talks about uh, people will be deceived, and so I'm talking tonight about the description and deception of the last days. But I've got good news. I'm not going to end this on a depressing or negative note. I've got some good positive things that we can all acquiesce to in our in our hearts and minds. First of all, we need to be aware and realize that what's going on in the spiritual warfare and the poisoning of the mind of our younger generation in our public schools, out in the workplace, in the marketplace, uh, spiritual brainwashing and things. Uh, notice, opposing the truth, opposing the truth. People often will say to me, Brother Danny, uh, you're so narrow you, the, the truth you talk about is so narrow. Well, that's the idea of truth. If it wasn't true, it wouldn't be narrow. It'd be all over the place and as wide as the wide, wide world of sports on ABC with Jim McKay. Some of you remember. I know anybody under 40 doesn't even know what I'm talking about. So let me get back. Let me, let me get back to uh, first thing is to realize. Realize. And once we realize, we revitalize in our minds and hearts what is what is true we relate against the rebelliousness of this world we see that as some resist the truth we respond to the truth and have responsibility to promote the truth and god's word so i want to wrap it up with some positive 
positive, good things to consider in spite of the collapse of our values today, in spite of the intensification of evil. And we're seeing a couple of things in America. We're seeing a lot of false doctrines, and we're seeing ethical evil, what I call ethical evil. Isaiah said it better than I did. Of course, he was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. No wonder he said it better than I did. Isaiah 5.20, there will come a day when good will be evil, and evil will be good. Can I get a witness out there in digital Facebook streaming land? Aren't you sensing it and, and, and feeling it? By the way, do you sense and sometimes feel something atmospherically has changed in America? It's almost like we're in a foreign country in some ways. And the atmosphere, the vibes, as my generation in the 60s used to say, the vibes. Something's changed. Something has shifted. Now, economists and uh, sociologists call it a, a paradigm shift. But our shifting is more than just a paradigm shift. It, it, it is an unleashing of some things, and I believe it is related to the end days. Once again, as I began the study, I mentioned that the question I'm constantly asked, I was even asked it today, is what is happening in America today, and all the crazy stuff, and the, the pestilence, and the, vi and the virus, and, and then the violence in Seattle, the violence in Portland, the, the continuous violence there in Minneapolis, and I don't think the majority of those people are really uh, the people or the citizens. I think they're a rent -a mob. I think they're, they're a rent -a mob that go from city to city and, and burn down and, 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 and whatnot. But we're at the cusp of something and of a shift and of a, of a time uh, I, I change. So um, here's a couple of things that we could take away tonight, some things that I hope will lift you up. Number one, Live as if Christ is coming back tonight. Live your life each day as if Christ is coming back at the midnight hour. Remember Wilson Pickett and the song, I'm going to wait till the midnight hour. Well, you know what? America may be at its midnight hour, and we might be a minute or two from midnight. I believe the second hand has moved up maybe 10 minutes from quarter to midnight in America to one or two minutes to, to midnight. Live your life as if Christ were going to come back at midnight tonight. But second, work for the kingdom of God as if the second coming of Christ was going to come in a thousand years or a few hundred years. Do you see the balance and the juxtaposition? Live your life. Live your life as if Christ was coming back, the rapture, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But work, pray, study, Build Sunday schools, build churches, build fellowships, work for the kingdom of God as if the second coming was a long, long, long ways away. You know what? You do both, you can't lose. You do both, you can't lose. In this third chapter, in this third chapter of 2 Timothy, Paul, Paul writes, uh, in spite of like today, back then, evil was accepted and promoted by society, by our, our, our politicians, uh, by various things. So chapter 3, verses 1 through 9, uh, Paul writes and encourages us to turn away from what is false. Verses 1 through 9 of chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, turn away from the false. Chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, Follow those that are true. Follow the things that are true. Chase after God's truth. Chase after, as it says in Philippians, you know, whatever things are lovely, pure, of good report, mm -hmm. of good testimony, follow, be, and do these things. And third, not only do we turn away from the false and follow those that are true, but third, we continue in God's word. That's uh, verses 13 through 17. Look at verse 16 of 2 Timothy chapter 3. All scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, so that the person of God will be adequately equipped for everything. Uh, that, that verse 16, 316, is one of the most important verses in the Bible, and it's easy to remember if you know John 316. That was the first Bible verse I ever memorized when I became a Christian. 
But 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture, not just part, not just a few of the Psalms, not just what Moses wrote, not just the word of Christ in red, in a red letter edition, but uh, even, you know, even Leviticus. I know anybody that has a Bible plan of reading through the Bible from cover to cover does great in Genesis and just kind of goes through uh, Exodus, third book of the Bible, Leviticus. That's where they quit. <laughs> that's where they drop out. So if you're, if you're on a Bible through the Bible reading plan, uh, don't read Leviticus until you've read the other 65 books and then read Leviticus. And you'll be <laughs> motivated to do so. And then you could know in your heart that you read the entire Bible from cover to cover. I want to tell you something. My spiritual life changed the first time I read the Bible from cover to cover. It took me 13 months to do it. Then I did it with Haley's Bible Handbook. Haley's Bible Handbook as a handbook. Uh, and I did it the second time. I, I did it in four months. I'm in the process right now of my 78th, 78th reading of the Bible from cover to cover. My original goal was 200. I, I don't think I'm going to live that long, but I know I can make it to 100. I know I can make it to 100. I've read the book of Revelation through 139 times. That's why I'm preparing to speak more and more about our times that are right on the cusp of what's happening in the book of Revelation. So turn away from the false, follow those things that are true, and continue in God's word. Notice verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable. In other words, it'll change your life. There's profit in it. It'll bless you. And it is good for these four things, teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. And I've outlined this in ours. It's good for revelation. In other words, teaching, God revealing to us what he wants to know. It's good for revelation. Then it's good for refutation. So we stop doing the things and being the things that God doesn't want me to be. We, we refuse them. We refute them. It's good for revelation, refutation, and restoration. It's, it's restoration. If we slip away or backslide or go through a time or go through some months where we're out of it, it's getting back into the Word of God and committing what God has said that we get back. It's good for revelation, refutation, restoration, and best of all, regulation. Notice it says, so that the man or woman of God may be adequately equipped for every good work. It's good for regulation. So, turn away from the false, follow those who are true, continue in God's word. Understand and realize in these days the sinfulness of human self-will. We're seeing it all over the place. I, I'm not all that convinced. Our Congress people, now some are good and, and right, and among our senators and Congress people and our assemblymen and state senators and governors, some of them uh, have good hearts and good intents, and not everyone is corrupt or evil. But we're seeing a moving trend that they, they don't represent the people. They, don't, they, they represent the people that paid them to get into the office. Mm -hmm. Or they represent what the majority leader says. This is how you vote. This is how you vote. I remember back when I was pastoring up in Northern California, a man in our community by the name of Wally Herger decided to run for the school board. And he got elected uh, to the school board. He asked me if I would, would help him. Uh, as pastor, and I said I, I would. He was a, a God-fearing uh, person. I shared Christ uh, with him. He got elected to the state assembly. Four years later, he ran for Congress. I helped him in his congressional. He got elected to, to Congress, and there he is, a congressman. I visited him a bunch of times in Sacramento, had lunch with, you know, governor and th this person, and majority whip, and that, and, and uh, I I have to be honest with you, when I met our, our state representatives or assembly people or our state senators, as I sat having lunch with them and sat in, in the rooms with them, I thought to myself, I know this might sound wacky to you, I thought to myself, how in the world did these people ever get elected to this? These people are nothing. How did they, you know, and uh, we, we have, uh, you know, a lady in our church named Hilda that worked in city government in, in Costa Mesa and understands government work, 
But I, I expected, you know, among the senators, and the same thing when I was in the U.S. Capitol and had lunch with a Congress guy when I visited him there and got introduced to all these people. And, and I just thought, like, first thing, they're no different than anybody else. They're just, you know, it's not like they're superstars and they're, you know, they're just common, ordinary people. But I wondered. And Wally Herger said, Danny, here's my plans. Uh, after next year, I'm going to politic big time and I'm going to run for U.S. Senate and I'm going to win. And uh, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna recommend you that you run for Congress and take my seat. You're in the you're, you're in the district, and uh, you know. And I was flattered at first, but you know when I went home, I said, "There's no way I want to be that. I've got to hire." And I told Wally over the phone later when I just said, "No, don't, I, you know, don't get me going on this." I just said, "I have a higher calling. I'm not gonna step down to be president of the United States." A governor or a senator or a congressman or assemblyman or anything or dog catcher in politics. I'm not going to step down from preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no higher position, no higher calling. I'm not worthy of it, but for some reason, God wanted me in it and, and put me in it, and I'm still in it. And they'll have to probably drag me away and bury me to have me stop being in it. Uh, I may be past my prime at my age, but I'm still there and hanging in there. And I know once I lose my capacity or this and that, I'll, I'll retire and step down when I'm no longer useful. In this. So let me wrap this up here. Uh, we need to be aware of the time we live in. Uh, we need to be aware of the time we live in and see what's going on. And then we need to be aware of the approaching eternity. We need to be aware of the approaching eternity that is before us. And so we realize, we revitalize, we resist the evil, and we respond and relate to God's truth. We're in the last days. I, I really believe it. And here the last days is not just talking about the last 2,000 years of Christianity. This is related to the last days before Christ returns. That's the context. Or as German theologians call it, and I can't resist, I was once adjunct professor of theology and Bible at Golden Gate Baptist Seminary and taught in a few other Christian schools and things. Uh, this knowing our situation is called Sitz im Leben. Sits in Laban. It's German for where you're sitting in life. Sits, sitting. Of course you knew that. Laban is life. Sits in Laban. Where we are sitting in life, we need to be aware of the sits in Laban around us. We need to be aware of what's happening suddenly and swiftly. All of a sudden, like somebody turned on a switch of what is happening to our nation politically. And the lying liars that are lying to us. And they think we're that stupid. Well, Bible believers... Christians and some wise people, they're not buying and drinking the Kool-Aid. So this is a time that we turn away from what's false, and we turn to what's true. We continue in God's Word. We be aware of the time, and we be aware of approaching eternity. Because, folks, all of this is temporary, and it's all going to go away. What is it? Seventy. 80 years this past week I did I did I was a part of two memorial services both of our church folks one Rosie Montoya and then the other day uh, there for Laura Keglovitz and I spoke in the Laura Keglovitz memorial service I quoted I quoted from Psalm 90 12 and Psalm 90 10 Psalm 90 10 says this that uh, we have 70 years and if by strength, 80. And Laura went home to be with the Lord at 85. So she went past, uh, I use the term expiration date. When I was born, and those doctors in Germany of my Hungarian parents who were hiding from the Russians because the Russians were looking to kill my father. My father was on a death list. My grandfather was in Hungarian politics. He was in the cabinet with the prime minister of the nation of Hungary. And when the Russians took over our family, among many, many, many others, was singled out to be liquidated. You know what that means, executed. And my father told me that some Russian soldiers came up to my father and had a paper and said, do you know this man? He lives in this village. 
and uh, so before he met my mom and before I came along, of course, do you know this man? And my father was the one on that paper. My father said, I, 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 I know of him. I think he left. I think he moved to Budapest. Yeah. Miles and miles and miles away. The next day, he dropped everything and escaped into Germany, free Germany. Never said goodbye to my grandmother and grandfather on my dad's side, but he got word to them that he's alive, survived the war, he's there, and, and, and things uh, escape and hiding. So when I was born, February 6, 1949, in the city of Breitengusbach, Germany, outside of Munich, or as they say here, Munchen, uh, two things happened. One, the umbilical cord was cut, and they roughed me up a little bit to get me crying. And uh, what the doctors did not see is the expiration date. The expiration date that God put on me and also put on you. We don't see it. It's not stamped like a milk carton in your refrigerator or a little plastic bag of hot dogs in your refrigerator that has an expiration date good until 2 14 23 or, or the milk, which, of course, sours quickly. But we have an expiration date. And so we need to be ready. That's why we need to be aware of the times we live in, the time we have left, and aware of the approaching eternity. And last, as I close in prayer, love God, love God's Word, love God's church, love God's people, and love this nation. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you that in spite of the fact that we do live in some perilous times and it seems that that it has accentuated, it's been accelerated, and we do live in a time that people oppose the truth, oppose the gospel, wish churches would be shut down because we are one of the last and few repositories of truth and values. So in spite of the collapse of values in our nation and the intensification of evils, false doctrines and ethical evil, we pray, Lord God, Lord God, that you will use us to be salt and light in this world, that we will make a difference, that, uh, Lord, that we will see our time uh, on a big rescue mission, rescuing and snatching people, so to speak, as Paul wrote, out of the fire. Teach us to turn away and discern what is false and what is truth. Jesus, you said that you are the way, the truth, and the life. We thank you that you are the truth and you give us truth. And your word is truth. We want to follow your truth and continue in God's word. So, Father, as we respond to you, Lord, as we are opening more and more, in more and more ways in the life of our fellowship here in the upcoming days in the summer, and uh, eventually things back to normal, but there won't be the old normal, but a new normal that is vitalized in you. Lord God, that is strengthened in you. Lord God, that you, some of us have been through a fire. We know what it is for whatever entity, whether it's demonic, whether it's antichristic, whether it's our own politicians, whether it's our own, our own leaders trying to take away something from us that you've given to us. Let us hold on. And let us be wise. Let us really be woke in the real, true, spiritual awakeness from your light and your word and your truth. For I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you for watching. Sunday, 1045, same channel, same station, same Facebook. I'll see you then. Take some time. Uh, for, for prayer. We do want to pray.